Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hasn't this been a great conference? I think it's been amazing. I, I've just learned so much. How many people in here are involved with neonatal, neonates, neonatology? Oh, good. I'm talking to my friends. OK. Um, neonatal Evaluation and Outcomes Network came out of uh, my going into the field of follow-up, which was not intentional, um, but it happened, and I'm very happy it did. So I'm just going to show the slide I'm supposed to. Now, these objectives were given to me, uh, and so I'm going to tell you but that when I put this slide set together, I was in a different mindset than I am today after having attended this conference for two days. So there will be some things I'm going to gloss over, some things that I won't go into a lot of detail because my colleague, Dr. Uh, Yvette Johnson, is going to follow me. And, and so, but I'm going to give you my points. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, why we need those follow-up studies for NICU survivors. And the term survivor actually uh, came to me from uh, um, Dr. Tanse at our very first summit because he was the one who said, don't call them graduates. They're not graduates. They're survivors. You know, look what they had to go through in that NICU. And if they were cancer patients, we would not be just, uh, talking about not needing to do follow-up at this point. Um, Cerebral palsy is a major problem that some of our survivors have, and we actually have early uh, abilities to do early diagnosis. So I'm going to touch on that and then talk about why we need this robust follow-up program, that we need this network, this collaborative. Okay. <laughs> It was about over a decade ago, the, in, uh, the Institute of Medicine actually identified that prematurity is not a simple condition. It's multiple gene environmental interactions that lead to a final pathophysiology physiological pathway that gives you that early birth. So there are multiple maternal medical conditions, genetics, environmental exposures, assisted reproductive technology, behavior and psychological factors, and then all those other things like neighborhood and social characteristics that are so important. Um, pre having a previous preterm birth is a strong risk factor for having another one. And all these pathways include inflammation, uterine distension, and deteriorating fetal or maternal health. So it's not going to be easy to prevent prematurity, and we can't just do it by medicine alone. Now, based on some major multiple uh, uh, international studies, like the Epicure the Australian, uh, from Australia and Great Britain, the NICHD, and then the French Epi, uh, uh, Epi page study, all of which was done in the late 90s, we now know that there are higher incidence of cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, and sensory impairments in our survivors. And that is, you know, they don't see, they don't hear too well. But the more recent studies tell us about other things, school and behavior problems, learning disabilities, language issues, as well as visual perception and attention deficits. So we know we're not doing well with terms of prematurity. We have a D. Thank you to the March of Dimes for keeping us on our toes. Our prematurity rate dropped for a while, and now it's back up. So we have lots of prematurities. We also have a lot of child health inequities. You know, these social determinants are so important. And that's kind of what we see a lot, that because of these uh, social determinants, we, that actually is why the prematurities, like the canary in, uh, in the coal mine, it is calling, is a major public health problem. And that's what we deal with. It's not just what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis of how to get that baby healthier, but it is an, a thing that can be intergeneration. It, it, it shows up all our inequ uh, inequities. And if we can address some of those things, the spillover effect will be much better. So stress, we've talked about those allostatic factors. They are a major risk factor for preterm birth. And I want to say that um, the, when they talk about, uh, I mean, prematurity is such a problem that we need to address it. And what, what the stress we're talking about is not the stress of having to meet deadlines and so forth. We're talking about people who have 
a lot of issues with having safety, being able to have food for their families, being able to get to where they need to go. And so all these things, are the problems of society are in prematurity. So the NICU is where we take care of these babies, and we do it around the clock. We have great equipment. We have great staff. A lot of you are out there. And, uh, you know, and we wait until they're physiologically stable, and then we go to transition to home. Okay, so why do we need NICU follow-up? Well, because there are a lot more kids that are, we are surviving today that we were not surviving when I first entered the world of neonatology. Uh, I mean, it seems to me with every year we have better technology, we have better uh, process, we have better things, and more and more babies are surviving today than they've ever survived before. Unfortunately, the providers we have that can take care of them after discharge are not keeping pace. You know, our residents are not spending much time in the NICU. They don't understand the complexity of the diseases that we are creating in these children. And although a child that has BPD may be in room air, he still has BPD. And any little thing can make that worse, including feeding. So, you know, so those are difficult issues to deal with. And when parents go to their pediatricians or their family practitioners and says that my baby is spitting up, my baby is doing all these things, instead of addressing the underlying prematurity issues, formulas are switched, they get put on medications for reflux, they get put on medications for constipation, not addressing the basic problem that the child has. You need parent support. These parents don't know how to take care, how to parent these fragile babies. And a NICU follow-up program should be the liaison, should be that medical home for the community pediatricians and all the agencies and so forth that are needed to help them. And we know that if there's not good compliance with follow-up, that you have higher rates of disabilities and lower IQ score. So follow up, although not glamorous, should be a very vital component of what we do as neonatologists. Now, when I put this together, I kind of said, well, okay, let's figure out what 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 the what we should be doing? What are the guidelines? So you know, we we're pediatricians, so we looked to the AAP, and it was 2008 when they wrote about the hospital discharge of the high risk infant. So much has changed since 2008, and I think that you know that that statement needs to be revised. I mean, they talk about who needs follow up, and we're pretty good with that. We can identify which kids need follow up. Um, Although I wonder if we actually do identify well, because there are populations that we don't follow that I worry about. And when, okay, babies need to be ready. They need to be physiologically stable. They need to be able to feed. They need to be able to maintain their body temperature and breathe, you know. Uh, although we send kids home now who don't breathe too well. So, um, so parents need the skills. And, you know, it's very interesting when I have done follow-up and I hear what the parents tell me of what they learned or didn't learn, and I know, because I'm on the other side, and I know that all these lessons have been given because I saw the checkboxes, uh, it's not, it doesn't, it, 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 it does not always carry through. They may not hear the message that we thought they heard. And of course, uh, arrangement for follow-up. I'm not gonna go through all the details of transition of care because my good friend, Dr. Johnson, is gonna go through it, but I just wanna show you how long the list is. So it's two slides, okay? I tried to put it on one, it was just way too small. But I mean, there's a lot of things that we do in the NICU be, to make sure that baby has a safe transition. We have a, a two people, two nurses, who make sure all those things get done. And yet, and then we want them to go to a medical home. Okay, what is the definition of a medical home? It's someone who can coordinate all of these things and make sure that everybody is saying the same thing. I would tell you that the parents hear different advice from different providers. And so the medical home is supposed to take care of that. How do you do that if you're a pediatrician and you have five minutes? 
How do you do that when you're a family practitioner and you have five minutes and you're seeing hypertension and you're seeing diabetes and everything, you've got this tiny baby in front of you? I just don't think it's feasible that it is important to have these special follow-up programs. So I don't know if any of you have read Sarah DiGregio's book. She just published it. It's called Early. And if you haven't read it, please read it. I mean, my eyes were very open by reading her book. And she's, she's a, a journalist who had her premature baby, and so she wrote about it. But I took a quote from her. She said, when we were discharged from the NICU, the doctors kept telling me that I should treat her like a normal baby. She doesn't need intensive care. She's medically stable. But my anxiety level was still in the stratosphere. I didn't know how to let go of two months of intensive care. That was my introduction to being a mother. Prematurity doesn't end at discharge. So premature babies develop differently. Okay, so a normal baby in utero is surrounded by amniotic fluid, has these wonderful movements that we've learned about, and they, you know, they, they thrive, their organs form in those conditions, and those movements are what they have to build on to develop their brain. We put them, even if in the best conditions with the best giraffe and all, the, all your no, developmental care, they are stuck by gravity. And we can't have them moving in their fine movements because that might rip out a line or rip out a tube, so we strap them down. And then we think that swaddling them is the best way to keep them calm when that is so antithesis to what they would have done in utero. They're not going to be swaddled. They're going to be moving. And that informs their brain to figure out what next so that as they grow as a baby, you know that lovely newborn baby who's just like wonderful, and then they start finding their hands, and they bring it to their mouth, and their feet to their mouth, and then they are doing all these things so they can learn to move and talk and interact with the environment, and it's very different. Preterm babies are different. So what is the goal that we have for neurodevelopmental follow-up? We have to support these babies and identify problems as early as possible and provide treatments to change that trajectory that they have. Our measure of success is that families are linked to all those support services that they need when they're discharged. Well, I want to tell you things change. You know, addresses change, phone numbers change, priorities change, and we heard from the parents yesterday, they were in a fog for two years. So no wonder when we call them and say, you have an appointment, they may not remember. You know, even the, you know, they may not remember that appointment, so they may miss that appointment. And, you know, I mean, those parents that came and talked to us yesterday, they had resources, yet they didn't know how to use it. And we, the, those resources are out there. How do we bridge that? And, and I just don't think we're doing as good a job as we could be doing. So home care, there's a lot to home care, I know. But I just want the list to let you know what's available. There's a lot of things out there, but are the families accessing that care? And, you know, we ask a lot of these parents. I mean, you know, a lot of them are sick, and then they had a sick baby. And, you know, I have parents that are going through dialysis, who are, you know, diabetics, who have their own health problems. And then we send them home with babies that need G-tubes, that have tracheostomies, that need all this respiratory care, that, you know, sometimes have wound care, that we send them home with lines. You know, it's a lot. And we expect them to be able to resuscitate their babies when they, their babies don't breathe. Okay, so based on the literature, we know that this is a high resource need uh, population. You know, uh, so you know they need visiting nurses, they need therapies, they need early intervention, they need social workers to help them navigate all the paperwork, um, and they need early intervention. And it's a huge problem for us because there's so many, so many survivors. So consequently. People, the early intervention people are not paying attention. You know, I have kids that are born at 500 grams that had grade four IVHs that don't qualify for ECI. That's a problem. Who's going to take on that charge? The families don't. So I'm going to quote Sarah again. 
And she says, every premature baby should get access to developmental care and therapies as they grow, if they need them. We're quite lucky in this regard. Not only did we qualify for our NICU's excellent follow-up care, but she automatically qualified for early intervention because she was weighing less than 1,000 grams. Doesn't happen to our 1,000 gram babies. So bottom line, NICU care is very profitable. All the hospitals want one. They all want a level four. They all want a level three. Follow-up care is not. I mean, I would tell you that uh, we, I come from a program that has 40 years of follow-up, and we have evolved in many ways, mostly because by doing follow-up care, we could never support the program. You know, I remember golf tournaments. I remember galas. I remember, uh, you know, being on the board and trying to raise funds and so forth, and it just doesn't happen. So how do you pay for follow-up care? Why don't we put value on changing the environment of these kids so that they can have a much better outcome after we spent a million dollars on their care? Okay. So what is affected? There are domains, major cognitive issues, motor issues, sensory issues, behavior and psychological issues. That is the trajectory that most of our survivors face. And you, you know, so in addition to those major problems, there are minor problems, you know. There are, their IQs may not be as high as a term baby. They may have learning problems. They may have reading problems, comprehension problems, you know, all these things that are necessary to become a part of our society. We have a very advanced society where you cannot succeed if you don't know how to read, if you can't uh, comprehend if you can't learn. And that is one of the trajectories that can happen to our babies, in addition to other problems in, uh, with behavior. And if you can't behave, it's hard to go to school. You know, the ki they want to send you home. Okay, so there are a lot of challenges, and I think that's one of the things that drove me on this task. When I first was tasked with doing follow-up, one of the things I did was I tried to read everything I could find. And so I put this together because there are a lot of challenges to predicting outcome. You know, I, I've been there where I've been able to, I, I look at parents of kids with grade four hemorrhages and say, your kid's not gonna walk, your kid's not gonna talk, you know, and so forth. Do I really know that? So when I went and looked in the literature, I found that, you know, a lot of things, a lot of the data that we have is based on what happened decades ago, and it's not the same as what we deal with now. Some articles talk about gestational age, some talk about birth weight. Okay, birth weight is easy because it's standardized, gestational age is a guess. There are a lot of single center things, there's some multi center things, there are population based, and there's nationals. And it's great that countries like France and England and Australia tell us what's happening, but they have such different societies than ours, you know. Um, the tools that are used, so many different tools. What's the best one? What should we be doing? How long should we be following? I know that from the history of our program that they were following it to, up to two years because you know, two years is what's gonna predict the future. And then they went to three years because three years was when they can send the kids to school. When I started the follow-up program, I realized most of my three-year-olds were not qualifying for the school programs, even though they had deficits. So there are so many other things that are in a trying that I felt like we didn't know enough. Okay, so this is a study, again, based on babies that were born in the 90s about when we can safely predict. Okay, so if we, if we you know, at the last follow-up exam that they did when babies were six to 10 years, they can show that 17% of that population of ELBWs that they had had what their impairments were. Only 41% of those were normal. Um, if you look at 
um, the cases without CP, and you look at what they look like at term equivalent, you can correctly figure out about 50% of the times what they may have. Okay, so you're kind of guessing, okay? If you can follow them to 12 months, you may be able to get to 60%. You have to follow them to three years to even get to 70% co uh, correct if you're looking at it from six to 10. So, and at this time, they said CP could, could be, be confirmed at two years. We're gonna change that, okay? So what, what about the impact on the family? That was one of the things I was very interested in. So this is a study that looked at what the impact on the family was. And that if you, if you were a family that had to take at least three hours of unpaid leave per week, if you had more debt, you have financial worries, you have unsafe home environments and social isolation, your family scores were much worse and that they were much worse with, uh, but if those families had early intervention and Medicaid, they actually have better uh, scores, meaning that they could get, they did better with their care. So, you know, it's kind of interesting, Medicaid, that's only for those really poor people, right? But th with that kind of a safety net, you can do much better. So, one thing is insurance matters, and a lot of our families don't know that. Do you realize that three-fourths of the pediatric home health care is paid by Medicaid? I mean, and they actually have a much better program. The unfortunate thing is they don't pay very well, so it's hard to get providers to do that. Uh, the kids that are on CHIP, there are a lot of states that don't cover follow-up. Private insurance is actually worse. We've had families to quit their jobs and, and get, so they can get on Medicaid because it's so much better when you're, when you're talking about follow-up. And then any of these non-group plans really don't provide very well for um, the, these kids, so it's very important. I mean, so part of the problem is who wants to pay for follow-up, you know? I mean, we need to do it. I don't know of a single insurance program of a patient that has cancer or has had major surgery that they don't pay for follow-up. Why are they not paying for follow-up for this group? Okay, so there are some public benefits, and I looked this up because I wanted to know. There are actually, the federal rules say that they can qualify for certain weights at certain gestational age. It is still very income-based. But one thing our family should know is that when the baby is in the NICU, they can use the NICU as an address, and that may help some families get SSI. But again, I find that the families with more resources are the ones that are able to uh, access this. And we have some very difficult sick patients that when we see them in clinic and they say, um, you know, we don't, we, we didn't apply. Can we still apply? And I go, well, it's kind of late. Now they're gonna look at your income. So those are things that we need to think about. So that's kind of my background on why we need follow up. Okay. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, and if you didn't know, that was Machu Picchu in Peru, is, and this is giving us the, um, the top look down, which is what I kinda of did. Okay, so cerebral palsy, it is a permanent group of disorders that arise from um, prenatal or neonatal issues if you're a preemie. Uh, we heard that already. Um, Usually the diagnosis is not made until 12 to 24 months. There are certain types. Um, mostly what we see is the spastic um, type uh, for our neonates. Um, there are three tools that have been, um, uh, that have been well researched as to how we can make early diagnosis. One is getting that MRI. Uh, a neonatal MRI gives you about Six, 85 to 90 percent sensitivity of being able to predict uh, uh, CP. Um, we also, in resource utilization, don't want to get an MRI on every baby, so that makes it very difficult. Um, the Europeans and Australians have been studying this uh, assessments of general movements, and actually have studied it very well, and that early movements can predict with 98% sensitivity. 
And then there's a Hammersmith infant neurological exam, which gives you about 90% sensitivity. So if you can combine all of those things, you can actually come up with pretty good diagnostic abilities to figure out early CP. And I'm just going to show you the algorithm that was developed by Dr. Novak out of Australia, which is very complicated, and I'm not going to go through it because you won't remember it. But I just want you to see how you could do early diagnosis in as early as um, less than five months if you have all the right tools and the right equipment. And then you can go ahead and get them into intervention and hopefully um, confirm their diagnosis but also improve their outcomes. So why is that important? Well, brain development and refinement of that motor system it doesn't stop when you're born. It keeps going. And there's so much that happens in those first three years. And babies who can't use their motor cortex also risk losing cortical connections that give them other functions. And the behavior that they have by discovering and interacting with their environment controls and generates growth and development of muscles, ligaments, bones, and ongoing neurodevelopment. A baby that can move around is much more likely to have attained other skills than one who's stuck and can't move. So if we can do early diagnosis, we can maximize that neuroplasticity, minimize some of the deleterious modifications to muscle and bone growth and development. So waiting until 12 to 24 months is you lost a year or two. Okay, so evidence for, th there is some evidence, some very good evidence that there is good therapy. So for hemiplegia, early constraints, so remember w when we have um, strabismus and you patch the good eye, you force the weak eye to get stronger. It's the same principle with uh, constraint when induced movements. You take the side that doesn't work as well, and you restrain the other side, and you make that side work more, so you can strengthen that side. So that's therapy that's coming about, and hopefully we'll get the publication soon. Um, we know that if we surveillance the hip and prevent hip displacure, uh, displacement and contractures, you can prevent a lot of other health issues. So, And then there's this new... Um, Therapy, which is goals, activity, motor enrichment, or GAIN, uh, is doing early, intense, in which task-specific training at the home will improve motor and cognitive skills. So these are all things that are happening for infants that are in our studies that are going to be published soon, we hope. Okay. So... Um, I actually did a fishbone diagram for my clinic to kind of see what we need to get to CP diagnosis before 12 months. And it's not easy, but it is doable. So the tools that we chose that we would do was to do the hind training and the GMA training so that we could um, assess those. But that means new protocols. It means that we have to interact with our neurologists in a different way. Uh, we have to get our staff, and we have to get our pa families on board. Um, we need to measure. We need to collect information, and uh, we need to change our clinic. So there's a lot of things that we need to do, but we're on that pathway. So this is my sunrise on South Padre Island, one of my favorite places. Okay, so why do we need a collaborative? Well, our traditional reliance on clinical practice, on randomized controlled trials, has given us a lot of information, but a lot of the uh, underpower, we don't really understand the impact on outcomes. The new strategies of using collecting data and then doing quality improvement, looking at where you are, where your problems are and working on it on small details, has uh, all these learning collaboratives and so forth, has made a difference. It has moved the needle in many things. No one's really doing it in follow-up. So remember that development is a continuum and it has to build on earlier development. So 
good follow-up programs that start when the babies go home, not waiting until they're six months before we see them is important because there's six months that we didn't have an impact. So I think that the earlier we can get in, the better. Okay, so what we did was we looked at what we're doing and compared it to a process that's, that's available, which is called communities of practice. So we have a group of people, and because of Dr. Johnson and then Dr. Uh, Andy Duncan, in, uh, that, who was in Houston, we decided that it's important. We need to get people together. So Dr. Arnie John joined us and Dr. Roberts joined us. We actually have a number of people that have gotten together. But we are on a continuum. So we have a, we have a concern. We see that set of problems. We're passionate, aren't we, Jan? <laughs> and we know that we can learn more and develop better expertise if we keep this together. So we've had, uh, so we have the potential in this model. We're coalescing, and we're in this maturation stage. So Neon, this Neonatal Evaluations Outcomes Network, is part of this. Uh, we're following this continuum. Okay, what we know is we don't have enough evidence to drive good post-discharge care for NICU survivors. So far, we had, we've had our sixth summit, and we have established goals, and uh, we, we've done a number of things. So you can see what we've done. I will tell you that there are 16 programs throughout the state of Texas and Oklahoma representing eight private and eight academic programs. Over 3,000 babies a year are seen through this collaborative. We have a lot of barriers. Not going to go through it all, but it's right there on that. We did decide, because it's low-hanging fruit and it's something out there already, that we would pick up early identification of CP as a project. And so we have some baseline data from seven of our sites. We know that we're not diagnosing them early. And most of the group is going about getting GMA, which is very expensive. And a lot of people, because of their dedication to this field, are going through and getting this training. So. What are our long-term goals? We need money. We need money. Uh, we also have, thank goodness, the support of TCHMB, who's going to try to help us so that we can at least collect data, because data drives. And we need to be able to look at our data and say, what are we doing well? What are we not doing well? And how can we do it? And then what I want to put out a challenge to you is that NICU follow-up is very important. It's a very vital part of what we do. We took a situation where fam uh, you have a sick child. We made the health better, but we cannot m help that child reach their maximum potential without a good follow-up program. And you know, we looked at other collaboratives, the California Collaborative, the Canadian Collaborative, and the um, Colorado Collaborative when we did all our summits. And you know what we found? We're special in Texas because we are doing it grassroots. We're not doing it because some public health entity has said, you need to do this. We're doing it because we have the passion. We've seen what happens. We know what can happen. And we know what doesn't happen when we have families that are in the fog and can't comply with those early follow-up. So my challenge to you, all of you is, one, understand the importance of follow-up, that when the baby is out of the NICU, that does not mean that what happened in the NICU stayed in the NICU, that it has long-term ramifications, and we need to learn from the NICU and take it back into the, uh, learn from our follow-up and take it back to the NICU so we can improve NICU care. Thank you very much, and I'll take some questions. One minute, sir. <laughs> oh, and I have a, uh, a sunset. <laughs> oh, Dr. Savani. Um, thank you so much for, for that, Alice. I, I, I do want to uh, put a charge out to all of us as we go back to our hospitals, and this is one that I've been dealing with and fighting in our own system, is that if you look at the relative contribution to margin for each of our admissions in the NICU with respect to what it costs to fund a program like this for a year, it's a little bit embarrassing to me 
uh, that we don't do a better job of this. And so I did have a question though. If you look at these patients, it's clear that they're a different population than a term population. Um, but it's also very clear that they are very, uh, it is a fertile uh, soil for future contributors to our community mm -hmm. with respect to their productivity as uh, members of communities, as producers, as workers. Um, and the importance of the, of the family, particularly of the, of the mother in this situation to help maximize this population's potential. In your clinic, how do you evaluate, do you, what resources do you provide for PTSD, anxiety, depression, because so clearly those things do impact how uh, they, the, they parent these high-risk children? Well, this is gonna be a long, I'm gonna try to shorten it. So as part of what I learned in follow-up, I became um, in touch with Dr. Um, Martha Welch in Columbia, where she has a program called Family Nurture Intervention, where you nurture the family in the NICU and you provide for them to get together. And so from learning from that, understanding this development of mother-child is so important and so intertwined, and that it is broken by isolates, by all of us and our policies of cleanliness and whatever uh, that keeps that mother and child from being a unit. So we have a study going on with FNI looking at that, but in my clinic, because I have no resources. My, I mean, I've stretched my resources to the max. We actually talk to every fa family about that. So I, my first talk, when I see a mother for the first time, I say, how are you doing? And they look at me like, no one's asked me how I'm doing. You're here to see the baby. And I say, no, I need to know how you're doing. Because how you're doing impacts how your child is going to do. And I talk to them about developing an emotional connection to their child, which is something that brings a lot of tears because you know they hadn't been really able to parent. They've done tasks. They've done all the tasks we've asked them. They've fed, they put them in car seats, they've swaddled, they've done all these things, but they haven't parent. They haven't given of their emotions and receive from their baby. So we work through this whole continuum of doing that. And I will tell you, some parents hear me the first time, some hear me the second time, some hear me the third time, and some take a couple of years to hear me. And you know, and it's very interesting, because when I talk to them about holding and talking to their uh, babies, you know, they say, I do it, but I know they're not connected. And when I know they're not connected, I talk to them again because we are using a tool for connect, emotional connection. And you know, sometimes I had a mother who had a three-year-old who finally got my message. You know, because she says I hold him all the time, but I hold him. You know, like there was not that emotional connection. So, emotional connection develops your autonomic nervous system, which develops a lot of things. That's another talk of mine, <laughs> another uh, life of mine. But all those things are so important and that you can't disengage one from the other. And I think I only have time for Dr. Savani. <laughs> um, Alice, thank you so much. Um, you spoke about a medical home, and I'm really glad that you did that. Um, the value add is um, measurable. And one way that we've done, um, convinced the hospital to actually fund and expand our follow-up clinic um, is that we <coughs> demonstrated in a randomized controlled trial that the care that those patients received in our Thrive Clinic um, actually decreased ER uh, visits and admissions to the PICU. And we calculated the um, uh, dollars saved. Mm -hmm. So for each patient that went through that clinic, you could save $3,000 per patient per year. And we've used that uh, unabashedly to embarrass uh, hospital administrators in getting our clinics uh, increased in size with more resources and so on. Uh, I'm happy to share that paper. You would, I would uh, love one. that. Um, but I think that that provides a model for how you can get past this sort of funding uh, barrier that we all face in terms of follow-up. Uh, 
Uh, but I commend you for all the work that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, that's what we want. We want to be able to collect data. And as we've heard in this conference, how difficult it is to collect data uh, so that you can answer those questions. Because, uh, you know, you, you have this feeling, but, you know, every project takes many days and weeks of someone's time. And you got to be able to find that time. So thank you so much. Hi. I have this mic. Yes. Uh, you know, insurance start. matters. <laughs> I, I, I want you to know I'm speaking from the dark side. Um, I work for an insurance company. Mm -hmm. And I'm not naming it deliberately because I'm not authorized to speak about a lot of things. But I want to share with you what we do because I'm the Star Kids medical director. The things that you're talking about in terms of follow-up care, we're working on the same projects that you are. Mm -hmm. And you need to reach out to the insurance company. You're more than to, welcome to, work, to come to, to our meetings. <laughs> on these things, because we provide a lot of the services you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Not only that, we also provide behavioral health sometimes for the parents um, and respite care. I mean, this is all really predefined. It's not because we're so altruistic. It's because it's predefined the TMPPM, the Texas Manual. And, and therefore, there are specific things that we're committed to doing for these very severely impaired children. So I would encourage you to co-op with the insurance company, um, that whoever it is that the patient is with. And I recognize that about three quarters of them, there's another quarter that we're not involved with because I'm dealing with government services only. But I want you to know that it's available and the support is available, and the long-term follow-up, and the care that you're talking about. Thank you. Like I said, we would invite you to our summits. <laughs> Probably have time for one quick question, if anyone has anything else. Dr. Canton. So great, great talk, great, great ideas. I, I was kind of... Uh, thinking about the, the funding and trying to get uh, more hospitals to support these uh, follow-up clinics. And, you know, as, as I talk to CFOs, it's always about ROI, right, return on investment. So, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a longer meeting to talk about it, but I think there's a way to leverage that uh, in which it can be seen as a win-win between the hospital and the patients. Um, specifically, and you had mentioned this in, in your talk, it's, um, it, it's a way to ensure that the patients continue to get uh, their primary care from the team who originally took care of the patient is much more familiar with the patient. Mm -hmm. um, to be totally business-like about it, from a business sense, that means lack of leakage. Um, I that's like that, but, Alex. Well, no, it, it, that's truly how You know, I'm just across the street. It. Let's get together. Yeah, because um, <laughs> uh, that's, the way, that's the way we've been trying to leverage things um, because, for instance, in, in the private community, these patients fall into the cracks where uh, the primary care pediatrician isn't readily available. They have a question. It's a complex kid. And so we've been trying to get the hospital to create uh, they, they have kind of call a nurse, but we want it much more complex where there's an APN that's available to answer questions, to uh, provide service, possibly go out eventually to the homes. Um, and it's expensive, but it's a win-win. Like I said, Alex, I'm across the street from you. So let's get together because we know you have input with the legislators. <laughs> and I think that's where we need to go, not with the individual hospitals, but uh, we need to advocate for um, better care for the, those children. Thank you.